This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church. Whether you are here with us in person today or joining us online, welcome. I invite you to stand now as you are able for the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Let us worship God together. Our opening hymn is number 307. Church's story bring us but to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of each other. For the facing of each other. Lo, the hosts of each Scorn by Christ assail his ways from the fears that long have bound us free our hearts to faithful praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. For the living. gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Save us from salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, with the serving we are done, serving thee who we are. Let us pray. Grant us, O oh Lord, the grace always to do and think what accords with your purpose, that we who cannot exist without you may be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. People of God, we come now to the time in our worship where we gather up our needs to look perfect and to project a good image and give them to God as we honestly assess our need for God. Putting away falsehood, 
let us all speak the truth to God and to our neighbors, confessing our sins together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not lived as your faithful children. We have been angry with the world and nursed grudges against our adversaries. We have hoarded the fruits of our labors rather than share our bounty with the needy. We have not built up our neighbors with words of kindness, but have indulged in evil gossip. We have not forgiven as we have been forgiven. Heal us, O God, and give us the grace to love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. Now be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our praise to God. God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he you may be seated, and I'd like to spend some time with our young disciples. Good morning. Nope, we got one more. Come on, everybody. <laughs> here, why don't you sit here? Well, it's good to see you all this morning. How has your summer been? Has it been good? Yeah, what's coming up in the next week or two? Oh, goodness. Well, I hope it's a great school year. So, um, I'm only going to be here with you two more Sundays, today and next week. So we're going to do our mystery box today, and then next week we're going to do something special. But let's not think about next week quite yet. Um, Theo and his mom took the box home this week, 
And you haven't even seen what's in here, have you? No. So we'll see what uh, Katie has put in here for me today. Grant, you want to open it? Oh, we got Play-Doh. All right. Here, you want some Play-Doh? I'm only going to be here two more weeks, so you can play Play-Doh in the sanctuary. <laughs> Play-Doh is fun. Do you, have, do you all still play with Play-Doh? Uh, yeah. You do? Cool. I know we do in our house. I think there's a really great message in Play-Doh. And uh, it, we can actually relate it to a story in the Old Testament where God says to the prophet Ezekiel, you are like clay and I'm the potter and every day I'm forming you in to something that I want you to be. So what, what kind of things do you like to make with Play-Doh? Oh, you want the pink one? Here you go, Faye. <laughs> what kind of stuff do you make with Play-Doh? I don't know. Oh, come on. What do you make with Play-Doh? Um, I guess drinks. Drinks, food. You can make anything with Play-Doh. Well, that's the same with us in God's hands. God can make us into anything that God wants. Maybe not dinosaurs, but God can certainly make us into loving and generous and kind people. What? I want to play with Play-Doh at my school and make dinosaurs. You make dinosaurs with Play-Doh? Cool. Well, just remember this. God can form you into whatever God wants, and that's God's way of showing love to us. Let's pray together. We thank you, God, that like clay, we are in your hands as the potter. Form us each day into the loving followers of Jesus that you want us to be. Amen. All right. Thank you all. As we turn now to God's word, let us pray together. God of power and grace, we pray that you would fill us with the wisdom of your word and the understanding of your spirit so that we may be your church, a people with dreams and visions at work in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The Hebrew scripture lesson today comes to us from the book of First Kings, reading in chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of these by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and sat, came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones, and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God.
From the Gospel of John, chapter 6, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Joseph, this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn to me by the father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? O oh God, may these my simple words become for us light today by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. What would lead Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in Israel, to ask God to take away his life? Elijah, like all the prophets of God, was an unlikely candidate. He was from a small town called Tishbe, which in Hebrew means captive. He came from a town in captivity, suffering oppression, not necessarily the type of place you might imagine God to lift up a spokesperson. Nevertheless, Elijah rose to great prominence in Israel as one who spoke truth to power. In particular, he, particular, he spoke powerfully to King Ahab, who was the recently installed dictator king over Israel. Ahab wasn't evil, so to speak, but he had an issue in that he did not discern who he should listen to and who he shouldn't. And one of the great voices in his ear was his wife Jezebel, who shortly after being married to Ahab convinced Ahab to convert the nation of Israel to worship the nature god Baal. When Elijah and many more of the prophets of Israel raised their voices against this blasphemous new religion, Jezebel sent Ahab's secret security forces to kill almost all of them. Elijah escaped the purge, but just barely, and he continued to speak against this blasphemous new religion. One day it came to a nasty crescendo as Elijah put the prophets of Baal to the test. Elijah went out to a flat place in the wilderness where he set up a stone altar and laid an animal sacrifice on that altar. Elijah taunted the prophets by saying that if their God was really God, that they should call on their God to come down and consume the sacrifice. So the prophets cried out. They wailed, but nothing happened. And Elijah kept taunting them. He said, perhaps your God is asleep or busy doing something else. Still, the prophets cried out more and more. They began cutting themselves, which was part of their custom. But nothing happened. Finally, Elijah called forward his supporters, and he had them pour gallons and gallons of water over the altar and the animal sacrifice. And with one simple prayer, answer me, O God, fire fell from heaven and consumed the animal and the altar. And had it not been for all of that water that had pooled around the altar, it would have burned up all the people too. The test was complete, and Elijah's God, the God of heaven and earth, of Abraham and Sarah and Jesus, was proven 
to be the one God, the one true God. With that, Elijah had all the prophets of Baal seized. He took them down to the river, and there he had them executed. When Jezebel heard what he had done to her prophets, she flew into a rage and called for his death. Elijah had done to the prophets of Baal what Jezebel had done to the prophets of God. And now he was facing execution. And on top of that, there was this wicked famine and drought afflicting all of Israel because of their unfaithfulness. And it was up to Elijah to tell them that God was upset and that they needed to return to God. Elijah just, he didn't have just no friends in life. The whole nation was angry with him, and the wife of the king was seeking to kill him. This is why we find Elijah today huddled up under a tree, as you can see on the front of your bulletin. In desperation, Elijah ran out into the wilderness, but he underestimated just how wild it was going to be, and eventually found himself dehydrated, exhausted, and starving. So under a solitary broom tree, Elijah asks for God to take away his life. Instead, though, God sends an angel to minister to him. Sort of like the angel that will minister to Jesus in the wilderness at the start of his ministry. The angel bakes a cake for Elijah and brings him a jar full of water and Elijah eats and drinks and then he takes a nap. The angel comes a second time and says, Elijah, you've got to get up because God's got more work for you to do. I don't believe for one moment that this story is unfamiliar to any of us today. And by that, I mean that I'm 100% sure that all of you know what it's like to be at the end of your rope, calling out in desperation to God. Battles with prophets, murderous queens, a nation of angry people, that might not be what we face. But there's plenty of other things. A pandemic that we thought was under control, and now here we are masking again to save ourselves and our neighbors. A social and political climate where public safety is seen as weakness. Divisions on race and economics and justice that run not through just the fabric of society, but right through our families, too. A dangerous mix of religion and politics, not unlike the system that executed Jesus. Uncertainty after uncertainty after uncertainty. Maybe just having to battle with some false prophets would be easier. But all of it, whether we recognize it or not, has inflicted on us just one trauma after the next. And maybe it's even pushed you to the point of calling out to God in desperation. That's kind of where I was this time last year. I'd had it. I'd had enough. And I certainly wasn't calling out to God for death, but I was absolutely... Actually, I wasn't at the end of the rope. The rope was five miles that way. Now, being a pastor during a pandemic is not something I would wish on my worst enemy. As pastors, we were thrown right into the middle of debates on public safety and epidemiology as if that's something that's taught in seminary. We were convinced to take ministry online 24-7 as if the church is a commodity to be consumed. We had to worry each week whether the worship videos were filmed clearly and could be heard easily, and then most painfully, and even within this congregation, we watched as lifelong and beloved members walked away and joined other churches because they didn't like our decisions on masking and social distancing. And the hardest part of my week as a pastor was always Tuesday morning, because when I got to my desk, I always had a voice mailbox full of some of the worst things people could say to each other. So I'd had it. And fortunately, I was able to do the one thing I've learned to do, 
and let's fall on my knees in prayer. At first, it was those on my knees types of prayers before God just begging for something to change. But then it turned into these hour-long prayers that just carried me through the day. The more I sought to unite myself with God, the better the landscape appeared. In those moments with God, I was reminded, like Elijah, that God is deeply concerned not just with our eternal health, but with our physical health right here and now. I was reminded that it is only God who is God. And that if I stepped away to take some time to rest and maybe miss something in that time, the kingdom wasn't going to fall to the ground. I learned in those desperate moments of prayer that there's nothing more sacred to God than us being whole. And to care for these great gifts that we've been given that are patterned in the image of God. I feel lucky because God spoke to me in those moments. And there was plenty of cake to eat, like the prophet. And the sweet water of God's mercy flowed abundantly. My friends, the sooner we realize and admit truthfully just how damn hard life can be at times, the sooner we have access to God's mercy. It's a true act of faith to come before God and say, God, I'm done. I've had it. Because as the psalmist told us this morning in our call to worship, those are the moments when God is closest to us. The psalmist says that the Lord is especially near to our hearts when they are broken. And that's because in Jesus, God knows what that's like. To be broken, to be betrayed, to be turned on. The God we worship and serve, this God who provides us with snacks and drinks and a place to nap, wants us here to be as healthy as we will be when we reach the great by and by. And this God walks us through our troubles. I've felt it, and I testify to you today that God's providential care is real and that God's promises are true. And so I ask you, will you reach out in faith today and in your time of need to receive from God that love that will never let you go? For nine years now, I've tried my best to preach the gospel here. It's been something like 467 sermons I've given from behind this pulpit. And in almost all of them, I've closed my sermons with a challenge. I've called you to do something with the good news and to do something in particular that will benefit your neighbors and those in need. But today I have a challenge that's a little bit different. Take care of yourselves. Please. Take time this week and in the days and months to come to take good care of yourself, to recognize those areas in life where you need the love and care and compassion of God. And then reach out to God because God will never turn you away. Love yourself as much as you are called to love God and your neighbor. Rest. Have a snack. Take a nap. It's there in Scripture. Drink plenty of water. Being a good Christian is about a lot of things. Faith, forgiveness, love, salvation. But being a faithful Christian is also caring for ourselves. Even if that means some things have to be let go. Take time to do that. It's not weakness. It's not self-indulgence. It's true faith. Because it's only then when we are well and whole, that we can step out into the world and bring others to the knowledge and love of God. God never promises us an easy life. But God did say, I will always be with you. 
And we can trust on that. Yesterday, today, forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. As you are able, I invite you to stand as we affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to invite Deacon Shannon Robinson forward, who will give us uh, some more information about this month's special mission offering, after which we will return our tithes and offerings to God. Good morning. I'm the counselor at Garfield Elementary. Garfield is the biggest elementary in the Enid Public School. I can't say much more than what is already printed in the bulletin. Um, the number of items are reported that were purchased this past school year does not include the many of gently used hand-me-downs for my kids, my own personal kids, and my uh, friends' children. I've also had to purchase laundry detergent and dish soap on special occasions until families could get back on their feet. I get shoes from foster feet. Um, and just know that your donations to this month's mission will be so appreciated from the children and the families at the elementary schools. Um, every parent that I talk to before, I, I always talk to the parents or the guardians before I purchase the items, and they are always very appreciative. And after making those relationships, they then come to me and ask when they are when they're having trouble for deodorant or bath soap just on special occasions until they do get back on their feet so anything that you can give would be greatly appreciated and when kids are clean clothed and fed learning takes place they have nothing to worry about and they feel safe so thank you
Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you have promised to hear us when we pray to you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer to you our prayers this day. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide, that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name. Share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Guide the rulers of the nations. Move them to set aside their fear, greed, and vain ambition to bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us, who consume most of the earth's resources, the will to reorder our lives, that all may have their rightful share of food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. Restore among us the love of the earth you created for our home. Help us to respect all of your creatures, that living in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Renew this congregation, this community, our state, and our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from crime and violence. Guard our youth and care for the elderly. And give us all a new vision of a life lived in harmony. Strengthen us who work and worship in this place. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, and any who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, so lead us to be present with others in their suffering. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your providential care. Finally, O oh God, with thanksgiving, we remember before you those saints who bore witness to the light. Grant that we may persevere in the faith to which we have been called, and at the end, behold your glory. O oh God, like a potter, you fashion us each day into the image of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Redeemer and who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 756. Oh, God. 
Remember, my friends, that it, it is an act of faith to care for yourself in this life. So maybe that day is today, maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's sometime this week. But take that biblical command, a snack, a drink, a nap, for that is God's love for us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share some sign of Christ's peace with your neighbors. Well, thank God. Good stuff. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>